It's great to have you worshiping with us here at Faith Bible Church. Excited to have you. We are going to continue our series in the book of Hebrews. And um, for those of you that are visiting today, we've been traveling through this book. We're going to continue through it in its entirety. But I want to take a minute and I want to get us all caught up to speed at the purpose of the book of Hebrews. And then we're going to dive particularly into chapter 4, uh, verse 12, uh, through chapter 5, verse 10. So if you have your Bibles with you, you're welcome to uh, open those up. We're also going to have that up on the screen. The book of Hebrews is important for us because we need to remember and recognize that Jesus had come, he had lived and died on the cross, he had risen from the grave, triumphed over sin and death, and he was now seated at the right hand of the Father. But the problem was that the people who had seen this occur with Jesus had begun to place their faith and trust in him, but over a period of about 30 to 35 years had transpired and individuals were now being persecuted for their faith, and they were beginning to wonder if Jesus truly was all he said that he was. They began to think, maybe we should go back to the way it was. Maybe we need to go back to the manner of the Old Testament. Maybe Jesus isn't what he claimed to be. And so this author is writing the book to these individuals to remind them to hold firm in their faith, to the trust that they have in Jesus. And then what he will do is he will go through and demonstrate how Jesus is better than all of the options that these individuals are wanting to look toward. We've traveled through, we've seen that Jesus is better than the prophets. We've seen Jesus is better than Moses. We've also seen that Jesus is better than all of the systems that are out there. And this morning, we're going to dive into a section that begins to demonstrate that Jesus as our great high priest is better than the priestly system that was set up back in the Old Testament to offer sacrifice in an effort and I'm going to say this, a futile effort to atone for the sins of the people of God. And so that's where we find ourselves today. And to do that, what I want to tell you is this. It's very interesting how God puts situations in your life because he knows you have a sermon on Sunday. What do I mean by that? Well, so you know that this past week after Sunday, Parker and I snuck away to get him to Jackson to see my family and then begin his job in Jackson Hole for the summer. With that, we took his car out so he has transportation, which means that I was either going to walk home or I was going to take a flight. So normally what I would choose to do is take a flight home. And as we got to the airport, came in and realized that we were going to be delayed because there was weather in Denver. Now, has anybody ever flown through Denver? What do we know about Denver? Whether or not, right, not whether or not, but weather, meaning whether or not, there is weather. Uh, Denver can be kind of a hairy place to fly into. Why? Because of the mountains and the turbulence. So we get to the airport, and I discover that our flight is delayed. I'm not worried because I have like a monster layover in Denver to get to Des Moines. And they say that we're going to wait and see what the weather report is, because right now no planes are flying in or out. Everything is grounded. Lo and behold, about an hour later, they say, yep, we've got a weather. It's clear. We're going to get on the flight. We're going to take off, and we're going to do our thing. So we take off, and what would normally be about an hour and 15 minute flight turned into, and I, will, I, I kid you not, the scariest flight I've ever flown in my entire life. And I've flown a lot of flights. We're flying, we're doing our thing, we're flying uh, into Denver, and the next thing you know, we start circling, and the pilot gets on the plane, and he says, okay, here's the situation, weather has come back into Denver, planes are grounded, no in or out, and we are gonna circle now for 45 minutes, and when at 6.45, okay, we have to make a decision. He said, we're going to let you know we've got 30 minutes of reserve fuel. And uh, at 6.45, if we do not have a go to Denver, we're going to be rerouted to Grand Junction, right? So we're circling around. And um, for anybody that has ever been kind of in Wyoming, it's kind of rural, right? I'm guessing we were in and around maybe like... Laramie Casper area is, is where I'm guessing. And I'm, I'm guessing some rancher was kind of looking up because we, there were two of us in a, in a holding pattern circling for 45 minutes. Okay? He's probably going, 
I wonder what's going on up there. Next thing you know, pilot gets on the plane, or on the intercom, and he says, uh, we've been cleared to go to Denver. And I'm like, okay, great, that's good news. And he said, but we just want you to know it's going to be a bumpy ride. And I'm like, okay, you know, done that. So we begin to land, and essentially to uh, my right, we were coming in from the north were the mountains, it was clear skies, to my left was an ominous storm. And we're coming in, and the turbulence was crazy. I'm looking at my watch, and I'm sitting there, and it, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I'm going, well, 6.45 meant we had 30 minutes of fuel left. We're landing, and it's 7.10. And it's bad. And so in the back of my mind, I'm sitting there, I'm knowing, you know, we don't have any options. This isn't like, hey, we're going to try. We're going to see how this goes. We're going to sort of make an effort. And if it doesn't work, then you know what? We're just going to kind of divert and go off and we'll figure something else out. We've got one shot. And that's it. And I'll tell you this, we're on final. And we could not have been more than 500 feet above the ground. And all of a sudden, the plane gets thrown down to the right, slide tails left, and drops. And I'm like, this is it. Like, this is it. And probably 200 feet before the runway, we right, and we come in and we land. And there was clapping, and, but I'm still physically shaking from that flight. I get off, and I call my wife, and she can tell that I'm shaken. Now, what does a flight have to do to, with today's message? I'm going to tell you that I was grateful that I had trained pilots on that flight who knew what they were doing because my entire hope remained in their hands. What does that have to do with today? Friends, brothers and sisters that have gathered here this morning, when we come to worship Jesus, one of the things we need to remember and recognize is, is that our entire hope rests in Him. All that we worship, all that we have, everything that we do, all that we believe rests in the best of the best. And just like those pilots, I was grateful that they knew what they were doing. And I don't know about you, but if somebody said, hey, you're going to have to go back and re-experience that flight, but what we want to let you know is you can either choose trained pilots who are the best of the best, or you can kind of go back to these guys who have a couple of hours of flight time. They're still trying to figure it out. Who do you want to choose? Why would I ever choose the guys that were still in training? I want the guys that have hundreds of hours of flight time who have been in those situations to get me home safely. But yet, here's what's going on. Individuals were on that flight, and they didn't like how it was going, and they were wanting to say, we don't want this, we want these pilots over here. Why would we ever do that with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Let's take a minute and let me ask you some questions. Sometimes in our lives, when we come forward, when we've placed our faith and trust in Jesus, we get on an analogy, a flight that we think is going to be a nice, easy ride. And we expect it to be easy, don't we? But life often has different plans, doesn't it? And sometimes turbulence, unwanted turbulence, can come in to no fault of our own. And what was happening was these individuals were becoming frustrated with who Jesus was because they were saying, we don't think that he can do all that we need him to do or he has done all that we need him to do. So they chose to go back to these untrained pilots. That's what we're talking about this morning. But in this text, we're going to begin looking into the priestly order we're going to begin to discover that Jesus is the best of the best. And to do that, we need to remember and recognize before we dive into this text that for hundreds of years, the manner of how the people of God offered sacrifice to God was through a sacrificial system known as essentially the priestly order. The Levitical tribe was the in group of individuals who would each time go forward and offer sacrifice to essentially pay the debt of our sins. So this morning, I want to just kind of run you through what that might look like to help us understand what had to take place in order to appease God and atone for our sin. And then I'm going to show you 
why Jesus is the best of the best. Back in the Old Testament, for hundreds of years, individuals would come forward and they would offer a sacrifice. Now, what we're speaking to here is essentially the annual sacrifice that is given or celebrated at Yom Kippur in sort of the Jewish tradition. Annually, people would come down to Jerusalem and the great high priest or the main high priest would offer a sacrifice to atone for the people's sin. Now, we need to remember in the Old Testament that God dwelt in the Holy of Holies, either in the tabernacle or in the temple. He was behind a veil in what we call the Ark of the Covenant. Now, to help us out, any of you who've ever watched the original Indiana Jones movie, right? That Ark is where God dwelt. Now, in a minute, we're going to remember, too, that when that individual looked into the Ark after it was open, what happened to him? Didn't go so well. He melted. So let's talk about this for a minute. The high priest would prepare himself. First of all, he had to be a man who was appointed by God. He had to be someone who demonstrated humility and sacrifice. And then he also had to be within the Levitical order. This individual would prepare himself, cleansing himself, to offer sacrifices for all of the people who are here. So this morning, we're going to pretend that I'm that high priest. You all have to sit back and hope that I know what I'm doing. Because if I mess it up, you guys, your sins... Does anybody have sin here? Okay. Okay. Let, come on, let's raise our hands. This is participatory, right? If you don't, I want to know your secret. And number two, you're lying. Okay? So everybody's hands... We all have sin. We're all banking on me. Right? Now here's the other thing. In a moment we're going to discover that before I offer the sacrifice for your sins, guess what I've got to do? I've got to offer the sacrifice for my sins. Right? And the Broncos haven't done that well this year. So I've got a lot of them. And so I prepare myself. Now the other thing that we need to remember is this. I would have a rope tied around my waist. And I would also have bells on my hands and on my feet. Why is that? Because when I go in to the Holy of Holies behind the veil, I'm going to offer the sacrifice first for me and next for all of you. If something goes wrong, right, the rope is there to pull me back as quickly as possible so I don't go up in a ball of flames. You're listening for the bells, and if the bells either start jingling really quickly or they're silent for too long, something's gone wrong. So you're to pull me back. And so I'm trusting in the pullback person. Okay? And lo and behold, the pullback person, guess who that is today? Old Joe. And old Joe has a hearing problem. Joe, you got me? You sure? Okay. So I'll move forward. I will go into the Holy of Holies and begin to deal with my sins first. And you guys are looking, and you're hoping. And you're wondering, how long is that going to take? And then I will deal with your sins. And back here, Joe's listening. He's doing his thing. And guess what? Joe's battery on his hearing aid isn't working very well. I go up here. Something goes wrong. And I'm screaming, pull the rope. Pull the rope. Pull the rope. Old Joe's back here, and he's going, he's saying he's full of hope. He's full of hope. <laughs> it burns. It burns. He's so excited. He's saying it's his turn. It's his turn. <laughs> now, this is humorous, but essentially that's how the sacrificial system was set up. And what I want to show you is this. Everything depended on that individual and their perceived ability to atone for your sins. 
Let's say it all goes well. Let's say that old Joe's hearing aid does work. I've washed behind my ears. We essentially do the sacrifice. And you guys are cleansed of your sin. And you leave here this morning, and on your way home, you're excited to get home, and somebody cuts in front of you, and you don't sing praises to God, but you say a few choice words. Does that ever happen to anybody? Guess what? All of what you've hoped for has been eradicated, and you've got to wait a year and do it all over again. That's what we're dealing with. And what we're going to find out is even when you left, and even when you thought all was well, even when I did what I needed to do, and old Joe heard me, and it all went fine, and you got home and nobody cut you off, it didn't work. It was incomplete. You are still guilty in your sin. So what we're discovering today is that people were beginning to look at their life and they were beginning to question because their life was full of turbulence. They began to say, hey, I've signed up for a flight and it's not going well. I don't want Jesus anymore. I want to go back. And this morning, we're going to discover, don't ever go back because we have the best of the best in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're going to ask this question, and that is simply this. Why is Jesus the great high priest? Some of you might have heard that discussed. You might have heard that in the book of Hebrews. You might have heard somebody reference the fact that Jesus is the great high priest. And the reason that we kind of jokingly but seriously went through what the high priest had to do was to help us understand that for hundreds, if not thousands of years, that's what was going on year after year after year, after year. And then Jesus comes along. Offers himself as the perfect sacrifice and removes all of that need for us as a people of God to have our sins atoned for. And what we're seeing here is the author is going to say, remember back to what you had and let's look at how great Jesus truly is. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you, we're going to take a look particularly at uh, chapter 4, verse 12. We're going to end at uh, chapter 5, verse 10. We start off and it says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Every high priest is selected from among men and is appointed to represent them in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as well as for the sins of the people. No one takes this honor upon himself. He must be called by God, just as Aaron was. So Christ also did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, Today, I have become your father. And he says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered and 
Once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. It's interesting because what's going on right here is, is the author is beginning to set up the argument to demonstrate that Jesus is the best of the best and he is going to use the priestly system of sacrifice to demonstrate how great Jesus truly is. And so this morning, what I want to do is we're going to take a look particularly at the first couple of verses of chapter 4, and that's 12 through 13. And what we need to remember and see is this, is that faith and adherence to God's word is what divides obedience from disobedience. And why is that important? We've been seeing how God was after obedience to who he was and what he said. And the author of Hebrews is going back to demonstrate the disobedience of God's people and what happened to them. He utilizes essentially this system in which he goes back and says, let's go remember the people of Moses and how they were able to escape Egypt and move toward the promised land. And then obviously, as we've learned in these past chapters, he reminds the individuals that that didn't go so well because the people were disobedient. He even reminds them that at one point, the people who God had delivered into the land or out of Egypt toward the land of promise got so upset, they began to say, you know, it would have been better for us to remain slaves in Egypt than to be brought out here. Now, can I ask you a quick question? In your walk with Christ, have you ever said something similar to God? You know what, God, it would have been better for me not to believe in you. I don't know what you're doing or why you're doing this. I think we all have those moments in our lives where something doesn't go the way that we hope or we want. And oftentimes we begin to think, you know, maybe you're not the right thing for me. Praise God for his steadfast love. Praise God for the promise we have in Jesus Christ. We continue on and we recognize that if we want to continue to be with Christ, while we are saved by grace through faith, the mark of our salvation is obedience to God's word. Now, I'm not saying that we all have to legalistically live our lives under a list of rules and regulations, but what I will tell you is this. In those moments in your life when you're wondering where God is or what he's doing, the manner of how you know that you are marked in Christ, that you have the Holy Spirit within you, is this. When the world doesn't go your way, you don't turn back to the world to find hope in it. You continue and remain in the promises of Jesus Christ. That is the very mark that indeed you are a child of the living king. We find rest in our God, as we've just seen earlier in this passage, when we remain obedient to him. And we trust him, and we trust who he is, and what he's doing in our life. And we come off of that to this next part, where the author is saying, reminding, okay, if you want to have that rest, then I'm going to remind you how we do that. And he says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Interesting analogy, isn't it? Sharper than any double-edged sword. The manner of what he's writing here is saying, look, you can't ride the fence. You can't sort of have a little bit of Jesus and a whole lot of the world. You can't have, oh, I prayed the prayer of salvation back when I was a kid, but it didn't really mean anything to me, and I'm totally living entirely for myself and for the world. I don't really care about that. I'm just kind of hoping that maybe that was what will do it, but I haven't lived for Christ or demonstrated anything in my life of obedience or trust in his word. Because what happens is, is when we look to the word of God, it should divide our heart. It should cause us to recognize and remember either we are in Christ or we are not with Christ. Why? Because it is sharper than any double-edged sword and it penetrates to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Analogous, don't over sort of theologize this, 
but to show us, look, there is no riding the fence. There is no one foot in for Jesus and the whole part of your body in for the world. You are either in Christ entirely or you are out of Christ entirely. Why? Anybody read the word and get convicted by it? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? The world would say it's a bad thing. For those of us that are in Christ would say it's a good thing. Because what that's doing is, is it's demonstrating indeed that the Holy Spirit is within us. Why? Because it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Here's another thing. Notice how it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. How many times do you hear people out there saying, follow your heart? Don't follow your heart. Your heart is wicked apart from Christ. And the word judges the attitudes and the thoughts of the heart. The word is what writes my heart. The word is what tells me what I should and should not be doing. Now, I do so because I'm saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. But I know that I'm saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ because my heart wants to obey not myself, but God's word. Because it is sharper than any double-dead short. And it does divide soul and spirit, joints and marrow. And nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. How many of you put your best show on when you come to church? If I were to ask you a question, how was your ride to church this morning? Would any of you be willing to be honest with me? Did you have the praise music on? Was it just a joyous ride? Were you singing praises to Jesus? Did you get into the parking lot with enough time? Did you walk in ready to praise God? How many of you got here with just enough time? How many of you maybe had an argument before you got into church? And then you cleaned yourself up, got ready to go. And here you come in, and you're kind of trying to demonstrate to everybody that you're okay. But God knows what's going on in your heart. The whole purpose of this is just to demonstrate to individuals, look, God knows what's going on, okay? And what we're going to discover is this. It's not in a manner of trying to essentially make you feel bad. It's a, a manner to show you that God is sovereign, that he sees all and knows all, and that he wants you to be part of his family, and what we're going to discover in a minute is not only does God see everything, but God is able to sympathize with us in our weakness. Everything uncovered and is laid bare before the eyes to, um, of him to whom we must give account. We've said this before, but I just want to ask if um, I came before to you and I said, hey, you know what? Um, we've put a camera kind of to follow you the last seven days. We're going to just pop it up on the screen here for everybody to see kind of how your life is going. Would you be excited about that or would you be terrified? I'd be terrified. Yeah, amen. Thank you for your honesty. Yeah, I would too. Because there's some moments that I'd probably say, you know, could you edit that out? Could you, could you do me a favor? Could we review this and kind of clean it up a little bit before? But the word is designed to demonstrate indeed that it will divide the heart and that there's no middle ground behind it. Why? To draw us closer to God, to separate us for ourselves from the world, and to show us our need for him and our dependence upon him. And what we discover is this. If you have faith in God and you adhere to his word, that is what will divide obedience from disobedience. And the reason that I said that it will divide obedience from disobedience is we've come off a whole section that talks about the disobedience of the people of God under Moses. And yet what needed to happen was obedience to God's word. And then we get into this kind of next section. And it's interesting because um, he starts to sort of allude to the priestly order. He transitions, and in verse 14, he says, therefore, 
right? And we've said this before, again, when you see therefore, you want to understand why is that there? It is in summary to what has been stated earlier, but also then a transition to move toward the explanation of what will follow. Since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. We have a great high priest, Jesus, who is the Son of God, who has gone into the heavens. Let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. The purpose behind this is, earlier, the whole argument is that the individual's aren't holding firmly to the faith that has been professed. They're wanting something different. They're wanting to go back to the way that it was. They're getting on the flight to Jackson and they're saying, give us the trainees. We don't want the pilots. Why? Because I've flown with these pilots and that flight wasn't very good. I will take the trainees over the pilots. That's what they're saying. Now, I don't know about you, but if somebody came to me and said, Trevor, you have to go back and you have to experience that same flight again. And you can choose either the trained pilots or the trainees. As scary as that flight was, I will take them all of the time. And these pilots don't even compare to the best that we have in Jesus Christ. But that's what's happening. Because they didn't like that flight, they want to choose something different, and they want to go with the lesser of the two options. And so in verse 14 through 16, we discover this. Jesus, our great high priest, allows us to approach the throne of grace with confidence. This, this, these two verses could be an entire sermon series, and so I'm going to do my best to do justice about what's going on in these verses over the next couple of minutes. But what we read is this, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For, okay, comparatively, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And I want to develop this for you. We look at this, and the first thing that we need to realize is this. The high priest back in the Old Testament would go into the temple. Certain people could have certain access to certain courts within the temple. But you and I would be outside of the temple. Why? Anybody here Jewish? Okay, this is just a question. I'm not, this isn't racial. Okay? Nobody's Jewish. We're all Gentiles, correct? Okay, so we're, we're outside, right? We're lucky if we're even there, to be honest with you. And then certain individuals had credentials to be able to be within certain aspects of the temple. But only the high priest had access to the Holy of Holies. The guy that's tied with the rope, depending on old Joe, that has the bells on. Here's the difference. The high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and access God there. He was the one who would go forward as the representative of the people of God in an effort to atone for their sins. You had to wait on him. Here's the big difference with Jesus. Jesus isn't going into the temple, is he? Where is Jesus? Well, we see this. He has gone through the heavens. He's in the kingdom. That is now where God is. So a huge difference right there. But he also qualifies it. Notice he says the son of God. He's beginning to set up the argument that Jesus is qualified to be a high priest. Earlier, and we'll see in a moment, that the qualifications of being a priest is that they had to be appointed by God. That's one of the qualifications in order for the priest to be able to go and make the sacrifice. So the author is beginning to say that he is God's son in an effort to say that indeed he is qualified as a priest, but we're discovering he's the great high priest. Let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. 
For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way. In a moment, we're going to look at the qualifications for the high priest, and I'm going to try to just jump down um, to verse 2 of chapter 5. And it says, He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray. He's able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and going astray. What's the difference? That priest can't sympathize with you in your weakness and in your sin. What do we mean by that? So this priest, the earthly priest, would be able to come forward and would say, hey, what are you struggling with? And you might be honest, you might say, hey, I'm really struggling with this. And I might be able to say, you know, yeah, okay, that's it, okay, I got gotcha. you. I don't, I don't struggle with that, right? But you're sitting there, you're going, well, you, you, you don't know what I'm hurting, or you don't know these struggles. I can, I'll deal gently with you, but I, I, I don't know your experience. I can't relate to what you have going on. So I'll go up there and I'll do my best, and I'll deal gently with you. I'll kind of offer up what I can, but I have no idea the sins that you struggle with. And I certainly can't sympathize with them. But as we travel back, we begin to realize that the author writes that he's able to sympathize with our weaknesses. Why? Because we have one who's been tempted in every way, yet was without sin. We read this, and it's interesting because you hear people talk, and you say, you know, Jesus can sympathize with you in your sin. Does anybody have anything that they're dealing with right now, that you're struggling with in your sins? I don't need to know. God does, just so you know. And you're sitting there, and you're going, man, I, I don't know. I just don't know if he gets it. I don't know if, if he cares. He does. He knows exactly what you're going through. Because he was tempted just as you were. He experienced the same struggles in your sin that you have today. And the next thing is, is this. Like, oh, okay, well, that's fine. You know, I get it. He can, he can sympathize with me. He knows what's going on. But he's God. I mean, you know. And so sometimes what happens in this is people get this picture that Jesus, right, was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days, right? And they have this picture that, like, he's just kind of walking through the wilderness, like, yeah, I'm being tempted. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I got this problem. Boom, no, no worries. Oh, yeah, there's this sin. No problem. Yeah, I got this. And we all think, like, sure, he, he may know, but he didn't really have to deal with it. He didn't really have to struggle with it. But what we read in God's Word is he was tempted, and yet he resisted. Resistance means a force upon that you are pushing against. So it's not like Jesus just magically somehow didn't have to move away from these sins. He was able to resist them. And how did he do so? He did so by firmly holding to his faith in his Father and trusting in him. And so the reason that I bring this up is I don't want you ever thinking, okay, Jesus can like understand my sin, he can sympathize with it, but because he's God, he never really had to deal with it. He just, they just kind of bounced off of him. No. He was tempted in every way. He knows your struggle. He knows the pushback that you have. He knows how you're trying to resist. And the manner of how he was able to do so without sin is because he was uniquely connected to the glory of his Father. And so what's the purpose behind that? The purpose behind that is, no, we are not God. No, we are not Jesus. Yes, we are tempted in sin. Yes, Jesus can sympathize with us in our sin. But like Jesus, may we resist that by turning to the glory of the Father. Knowing that when we do sin, we have the grace and mercy that we've been given through our Lord in Jesus Christ. And so the next part of this we read 
is not only is he able to sympathize with us in our weakness, and that we have someone who's been tempted in every way, we can then approach the throne of grace with confidence. Now, I love this, because when, when you're in a kingdom, and you go to approach a king who has your entire life in his hands, at a, at a stroke of a pen, at a move of an arm, if he doesn't like you, he could say, off with your head. Nobody would care, and the order would be carried out. Are you going to approach that individual confidently? Are you going to come up and be like, hey, yo, king, what's up? You know, I've got this going on, I need this, I need that. Or are you going to approach him with meekness or fear? Because of what Jesus has done, we can approach the throne of grace with confidence. Now, I don't suggest you go up to Jesus and say, yo, dude, what's up? But you can approach the throne of grace with confidence, knowing that you have been saved through Jesus Christ, and you have received his grace and his mercy when you are in your sin. Why? We read these words. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Two very important words. What is grace? Grace is a free gift. We, we, we get it. We're given it. I'm going to be gracious to you. Hey, you know what? Take my car for the day. Right? Use it. Have fun with it. Hey, you know what? I've got some extra money here. Have it. Mercy is entirely different. Mercy is something of which we are guilty of a penalty. And we deserve the just punishment for that penalty. So simply said, I've said it before. I leave here, I'm all excited. I do 85 in the middle of Panora right now. Right down Main Street. Cameras catch me. It's obvious that that's me. Okay, I'm guilty of speeding in Panora at the speed of 85 in a 25 mile per hour zone in a public area. Okay, there is a legal charge for that. That's what I'm guilty of. Reckless endangerment. Mercy is that the judge says, even though you were caught, even though it's you, even though you're guilty of losing your license for however long the, law, the legal penalty is, I'm going to be merciful to you. And you aren't due that just punishment. And P.S., I'm going to be gracious to you, and I'm going to let you use my car for the day. And so what we need to remember is this. The charge of what we are guilty for is way worse than an 85 and a 25. The charge that we are all guilty of is our sin, which separates us from God. And the just punishment that we are due is to be separated from him throughout eternity. And the dwelling of where we are to be is apart from him, which is known as hell, which is a real place of torment and torture. But what God does is he says, I'm going to be merciful to you, even though you are do that. And by grace, I'm going to give you my sacrifice, which is my son, so that in his sacrifice, you, through mercy, are no longer due the penalty of your sin. And the grace that I give you is you can receive that freely. And so because of what Jesus has done, we can approach the throne of grace with confidence. Knowing that we will receive mercy. And we will find grace to help us in our time of need. What an amazing thing. We continue on, and then what happens is the author transitions at the start of chapter 5, and he begins to kind of quantify the high priest. And what we discover here, just kind of in the main thing is this, that in these first four verses, that the high priests were ineffective in dealing with the problem of sin. Okay, that's what I want you to see in this. He starts and he says, every high priest is selected from among men, okay, so they obviously had to be part of the Levitical order, they were selected from men, right? So they would go through, they would look, they would find out kind of who is the individual or the group of individuals that are the ones that are doing the, the, the right thing here. And then 
they would be appointed to represent it in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. So that's qualification one. They also had to be able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and going astray. Somehow you've got to be kind, you've got to be nice. You know? When somebody's having a problem or an issue, you don't look at them and beat them down. That's a good thing, humility. But also we see that he was himself subject to weakness. So this individual, as great as they were, was just one of you and I. They still had a weakness. And that is why they had to offer sacrifices for their own sins, as well as offer sacrifices for the sins of the people. And then we see, no one takes this honor upon himself, but he must be called by God, just as Aaron was. So they had to have a calling from God. Begins to delve into these qualifications and then will transfer and show the difference of Jesus. But the challenge is this. I want you to think about the fact. Would you keep coming to church week after week, year after year, decade after decade, century after century, if on every time that we did it, now, the main sacrifice was year after year. We got up there, I got all decked out in my garb, right? Did our thing, hoped to atone for your sins, hopefully did it right, right? To have you leave, and one of two things will occur. One, you'll leave here, and you will get interrupted by somebody on the highway and sin, and then you gotta go another week, or in this case, you gotta know another year. Or better yet, everything goes well, and you get home, and you still discover it's not working. It's not working. Ah, yeah, we'll, we'll keep trying. We'll keep doing it. It's not working. We go a couple of weeks. We go a couple. How many of you, after a year, it's not working, would say something's wrong? And we discover this later on in the book of Hebrews. We discover this in Hebrews chapter 10. Chapter 10, verses 1 through 2, demonstrate that as much as the high priests were doing all of their thing, as good as they looked, as the sacrificial system went on for centuries, it never worked. We read this. The law is a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly, year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Can I ask you a question? When you come forward today and you draw near to Jesus Christ in worship, are you grateful for the fact that you have been made perfect? If it could, they would, have not, uh, they would have not stopped being offered, question mark. If it really worked, if we were made perfect through these systems, why were they doing it year after year after year after year after year after year after year? It ends for the worshipers would have been cleansed once and for all and no longer have to feel guilty for their sins. That's the difference that we're seeing. When you leave here today, you do not have to feel guilty for your sins because you have been forgiven in Jesus Christ who is the great high priest. Now if you are in sin, I pray that the Holy Spirit causes you to have guilt to be forgiven of it, but how many of you are in this Old Testament way of looking at it and just thinking, God's never going to forgive me. God can't forgive me. God won't be able to forgive me. I'm trying. I'm doing my thing. I'm offering the sacrifices, and it's not working.
Jesus comes and he lives and he dies to where our sins are entirely forgiven. And why? Because what we're going to see is this. Jesus doesn't go up and offer a goat on our behalf. Jesus is the goat. And if all of you love those analogies, the goat, the greatest of all times. The goat. Okay? You might want to write that down. Why? Because he's the sacrifice. And so when you think about this, when you come to worship and you think about, you know, back in the day, I had to to rely on a guy who is sinful himself to atone for my sins once once a year to hope that maybe he can do so. And if he does it right, if it all goes off well, he doesn't get burned. He comes out and says, we've offered sacrifices but I know that it's just a farce. I know it's just smoke and mirrors. To then have Jesus come forward as the great high priest and say, we're done with this, and I'm not offering a goat. I am the goat, and I'm going to offer you me. So your sins may be forgiven. Done. No more the year after year. No more of the repetitive insanity of trying to forgive you of your sins. I will offer me and you will be freely forgiven and your sins will be forgotten forever. End of story. That's why Jesus is the goat. That's why Jesus is the best of the best. And so then in these next verses, 5 through 10, the author says, I've shown you what the qualifications briefly of the high priests are. I'm going to show you how much better Jesus is. And then he's going to go on later in chapter 7 and develop that entirely as he compares Jesus to Melchizedek. In verse 5, he says, So Christ, comparatively, okay, this is a comparison to what has been stated earlier. So Christ also did not take upon himself the glory of becoming high priest. So he's just qualifying this. We want you to know that Jesus didn't come forward and say, you know what, I, just, I'm, I'm, I want to be high priest. He met the qualifications. And what's important is, if you were the people of God back then, it was important for you to recognize Jesus' credentials. But God said to him, you are my son. Today I have become your father. He's quoting from Psalm 2-7 there. People would recognize that. People would remember the words of David. And then he continues on. He says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Interesting enough, he's quoting from Psalm 110 verse 4. I'm not going to develop all of Melchizedek right now. But why is that there? You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Wait a minute. Why isn't he a priest in the line of Aaron? What's different about Melchizedek? Why is it mentioned? Briefly, Melchizedek is uh, mentioned in Genesis 14, I believe. And the main difference is this. All of the other high priests under Aaron were priests, and they were a big deal. But the difference is, Melchizedek... Melchizedek was not only a priest, he was a king. That's the difference. Why is that important? Because Christ, being the great high priest under the order of Melchizedek, is not only a priest, but he is in the kingly line. And that will be developed later in Hebrews Why is it important for Jesus to be the king? Because as the king, he is the king of the kingdom, of which you and I earlier discovered that we are sons and daughters who Jesus is no longer ashamed of. And because of that, we have an inheritance that cannot be shaken because he's not ashamed to call us brothers or sisters in Christ. 
And so he continues on. After we discover that he's in the order of Melchizedek. And he will talk about warning against falling away. And that's for next week. And so what we see in these verses of chapter 5, that the high priests were ineffective in dealing with the problem of our sin. Yet Jesus, our great high priest, is entirely effective. Verse 7, it says, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Right here, notice how much Jesus, in his time of life on earth was offering up prayers for you and I. Prayers for the people of God. Petitions and loud cries to the Father. He's also offering up prayers and petitions to the one who could save him from death. Father, if there's any other way, may it be done. But if not, then thy will be done. He learned from obedience what he had suffered. Right there, that statement means that by obedience to God, he learned how to grow in him. And that he did suffer like you and I did, which is a re-emphasis to the aspect that he's able to sympathize with us in our weakness. And once made perfect. Now, be careful on this. It doesn't mean that Jesus was imperfect. Made perfect is the reference to the cross. Once made, when he died, ascended into heaven, kingly order. All was done. He became a source of eternal salvation for all who... Notice this. For all who pray the prayer... and then walk in disobedience. For all who obey him. Now, we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus. We pray the prayer, but the mark of salvation is obedience to God and faithfulness to him. And was designated by God to be a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. A few things I want you to see, and then I'll leave us with our take-home truth. This is what we're driving to. Why get on the flight to Jackson, for lack of a better word, with trainees when you have the pilots? Why go back to the Old Testament system when you have the goat, the greatest of all times, the best of the best, Jesus Christ? And what we've seen in this passage is simply this. In every possible way, don't miss this, Jesus surpasses the role of the high priest. Any manner that you think about the high priest, Jesus is better. We're just going to kind of roll out what we've seen in today's passage. First, all who receive and rest upon Christ have immediate access to the Father. When you receive and rest on Jesus Christ and you have a sin, you don't have to go through a priest in order to have your sins forgiven. You don't have to trust Trevor and wait for the Day of Atonement and hope that Trevor has washed behind his ears and that old Joe has his hearing aid on to have God forgive you of your sins. You can immediately go to him and say, Lord, I need to be forgiven. And you are forgiven, and it's done, and it's complete. Second, the priesthood of Jesus is a kingly priesthood which is forever and eternal. Earlier I said that he's a priest in the order of Melchizedek. The priests would come and go. The system would come and the system would go. The system was defunct. But Jesus comes forward as king and establishes the kingly priesthood which is forever and eternal and it will not go away. Third, Jesus is a priest who can sympathize with us in our temptation and as accurately and entirely taken care of our sin problem. He knows what you struggle with. Period. He doesn't come to you and say, I'm sorry to hear that. I can't relate. And better yet, he says, I know what you're dealing with. 
I have been there and I have come to forgive you today. He doesn't come forward and say, I'll do the best I can. I can't really understand what you're going through. Oh, and P.S., by the way, don't tell anybody, but this whole thing is a farce. Fourth, the qualities of humility and holiness are what we see perfectly embodied in Jesus, our great high priest. His humility was being God. He humbled himself to die upon a cross for us. His holiness is as God. He is able to forgive us of our sins entirely and wholly forever. All of these ways, Jesus surpasses the high priests of the Old Testament. Why is Jesus a great high priest? Well, we've just seen it. But I'm going to leave you with this. Jesus, our great high priest is the goat, for lack of a better word, because he is entirely effective in dealing with our problem of sin, which allows you and I to approach the throne of grace with confidence. We can go forward to God's throne of grace confidently, knowing that when we are in Christ, when Christ is our high priest, our sins are forgiven. Period forever, eternally. Let's pray.